All right, are we, are we all set? Alan, all right. I would say get started, yeah. Okay, well, sorry for the delay, folks. Uh, it's actually about five after, uh, but we've overcome a few technical dif difficulties <laughs> and we're ready to go. Uh, welcome to a presentation by Don Appelstein on the subject of Founding Fathers Unvarnished. Uh, I am Alan Rogers, moderator of the uh, Senior Adult Ministry Committee at Doylestown Presbyterian Church in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. We are delighted to sponsor Don's appearance today. Uh, let me share a few words about Don's post-retirement work since leaving a law career. Don writes, since retiring, I have worked as a docent at the world-renowned National Constitution Center and the Museum of American Revolution, both in Philadelphia. And, and uh, he's been doing this as his way of giving back. This has offered me the extraordinary opportunity to interact with hundreds, if not thousands of guests about the Constitutional Convention and a revolutionary America. One of the many impressions has been that guests tend to compartmentalize events centered on memorized dates. In addition, because I was raised in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, surrounded by revolutionary America, and majored in history at Lafayette College, this led me to develop a number of presentations which are intended to challenge audiences to consider a longer view of well-known historic events. A different view, if you will. A few pre presentations are entitled Petty Patriots in Petticoats, uh, When Did American Revolutionary Really Begin? And for today's presentation, Founding Fathers Unvarnished. Reactions to these presentations in the past have resulted in the following type of remarks. Knowledgeable, thought-provoking, enlightening, great. This is what should be taught. Well, I think we're in for a treat today, uh, folks. Uh, there are 41 of us, by the way, uh, so it's an excellent turnout. So without ado, let me say welcome, Don Appelstein. Thanks very much, Alan, and uh, welcome to uh, uh, everyone out there. Um, as Alan was saying, uh, I started interacting with people and guests and so forth and realized that many times things are just taught by date by date, and we don't take a step back a little bit and take a larger picture of what's going on uh, in terms of, you know, everyone knows that Washington crossed the Delaware, but what was Washington's early life like? And I started looking at that, and that led me uh, to look at the early lives of a number of the founding fathers, uh, and that ultimately resulted in putting together this presentation which I found uh, entitled uh, The Founding Fathers Unvarnished Revolutionary Relationships. And one of the things that I want to do here uh, is to take a look at the early lives of the Founding Fathers and hopefully come away with a deeper understanding of what family life was like in the mid and late 18th century. And uh, as we go through, uh, uh, the slides, uh, you're going to see a lot of sort of facts thrown at you. Don't try to remember everything, but sort of take a step back as we go through, and try to understand how life was so much different back then uh, than it is now. Uh, so we're going to take a look at four founding fathers, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin. And uh, we'll take them in that order. And uh, Washington, as you can see from the slide, uh, was born in 1732 and uh, lived until 1799. Um, in, um, uh, in his young life, uh, George was, um, I, I'm having some trouble. I, I can't see the entire slide. Um, so, um, is there some way uh, that we can reduce the individual pictures of, of me or Alan so I can see the slide? Don, if you, if you mouse over the edge of the video boxes there, you can click and drag them and minimize them, or you can click the top 
of the box and drag the little boxes of video to wherever you'd like on your screen. Okay, excellent directions. And uh, I'm there where I need to be. So Great. let's okay. continue. Uh, young George, uh, he, his father, uh, uh, Augustine, uh, it was a second marriage. And his father died when George was just 11 years old. Uh, his mother, uh, Augustine's second wife, Mary Ball, uh, was a very, very difficult personality. And she and George, frankly, did not get along uh, very well. And uh, so uh, there's very little known about his upbringing. But what we do know uh, is that um, he, he uh, by his late teens, uh, he was... Uh, developing uh, surveying skills uh, in and around Winchester, Virginia. Uh, and what happened was that uh, he was taking the fees that he collected as a surveyor and started buying up bits and land uh, in the Virginia area. Uh, so he, while he lacked formal education, he really did understand the idea of accumulation of wealth. Um, his half brother, uh, from the first marriage, uh, was 14 years older uh, than George, and the Washingtons uh, owned 11,000 acres in the Virginia area, and that sort of put them in the middle of the uh, social strata uh, in Virginia. His father traveled from farm to farm, and they did have some ironworks and so forth, and as I just uh, mentioned, by his late teens, he was out there working as a surveyor and uh, using his fees uh, to uh, um, buy up land. Um, forgive me, I'm having a little trouble with uh, the slides. His father dies uh, and his older brother, who now uh, is 25, inherits uh, what we now refer to as Mount Vernon uh, as Augustine's uh, oldest son. Uh, and Lawrence uh, marries in uh, Fairfax. And the Fairfaxes were one of the most influential, wealthiest uh, families uh, in uh, Virginia society. Inns had a younger brother by the name of George, uh, and he and George Washington became best friends. Basically, uh, you know, uh, Anne was Washington's uh, sister-in-law. And what happens is, as a result of his relationship with uh, George Fairfax, he's introduced to the highest society in Virginia, uh, and the fox hunts and going hunting and balls uh, that type of thing, uh, and so forth. And uh, George uh, eventually marries uh, a gal by the name of uh, Sally uh, Carey. And she apparently uh, was quite a looker, uh, according to the portraits, and she uh, was a dancer. Uh, George Washington, uh, sort of, this is his first sort of encounter with uh, romance and so forth. And he believes that he is falling in love with Sally, who, of course, is his best friend's wife. Uh, and uh, so that sort of complicates things. And frankly, he's sort of up in the air. Uh, he's uh, late teens, early 20s, his first romance. Uh, and this is something that, that he had, just wasn't really prepared for. 1752, his older brother, Lawrence, uh, dies of tuberculosis. And Lawrence's wife, Anne, uh, formally inherits uh, Mount Vernon. However, she leases it to George because she went back to her own family. Uh, and so he now occupies Mount Vernon at the ripe old age of 20 years old. Uh, eventually, Anne dies uh, several years later, about nine years later. And George, at uh, 29, uh, now becomes the owner uh, of Mount Vernon. Um, with the Fairfax's help, 
uh, he's uh, appointed a major, which is a senior officer uh, in the Virginia militia at 20 years old. Um, and uh, a couple years later, he contracts a dysentery while he's living at Mount Vernon and Sally comes over and nurses him uh, and so forth. Meanwhile, George William, his best friend, is over in England. And he realizes at this point that uh, his dreams of marrying Sally are just not going to work out. Uh, again, this was his sort of first uh, introduction into romance and so forth. Um, and um, he, uh, through the social networking and so forth, is introduced to a young widow uh, who has two children. And that young widow, of course, was Martha. Um, and uh, she had been married young and um, uh, had two children uh, by uh, Custis. And uh, he dies in 15, I'm sorry, uh, 1757. The result at 26, Martha becomes the richest widow in the state of Virginia. She owns 17,000 share or uh, acres, hundreds of slaves. She has two children uh, that she had uh, by her marriage with Custis. Uh, she apparently by personality was a, nor a very warm, welcoming uh, person. Uh, and eventually she and Washington uh, meet and uh, he becomes very close with his, uh, with her two children. And so this is his sort of second encounter with romance. And so he's torn between Sally and Martha. And it's sort of the difference between, okay, he really likes Sally, but the reality is, is that he's not going to marry her. She's married to his best buddy. And the reality is, is that uh, Martha begins to fall in love with him because of his attention to uh, her children uh, and so forth. And uh, notwithstanding that, while he's courting Martha, he writes to Sally, and signing my most undoubtedly uh, most obedient uh, obliged servant. Eventually they marry in January of uh, 1759. Um, and he, uh, Martha moves in uh, with him uh, to Mount Vernon. And again, George is very attracted to her uh, children. He can't do enough for them uh, and so forth. Uh, the daughter, uh, unfortunately, dies uh, from a seizure disorder in 1773. That leaves Jack, the son, um, and he's kind of a wild uh, uh, soul and is expelled from school and so forth. And um, he eventually goes off to college uh, where he's uh, got a three-room suite. Uh, he has a slave by the name of Joe uh, with him and so forth. And this is just a, a reflection of Martha's wealth and standing in, in society and so forth. Uh, Jack, as I said, is kind of a wild soul. He's expelled and he decides that he wants to marry a young lady. And um, George is against it, uh, wants him to finish college, but eventually Jack and, and Nellie run off together. Jack dies, leaving Nellie with two small children, known as Nell and Wash. And uh, Nellie remarries, which was frequently uh, happening, as you can imagine back then. And uh, George and Martha uh, adopt uh, Jack's children. Uh, and so you can begin to see sort of this, the, the way of family life and so forth uh, uh, back then. Um, excuse me, I've got I'm having some uh, mechanical difficulties. Here we go. Okay, let's go back again. So, um, the war breaks out, and George goes on to have uh, the life that most, most of us are familiar with. 
Um, and fast forward uh, to a year before George dies, he still has his pining uh, for Sally, who is now in London. Um, and notwithstanding all the results of him leading uh, the Revolutionary War, uh, winning it, becoming our first president, and so forth and so on, uh, a year before he dies, he writes Sally. Uh, and as you can see, uh, he talks about the momentous points in his life, which were obviously very numerous. Uh, and he said, nor all of them together have been able to eradicate from my mind the recollection of those happy moments, the happiest in my life that I have enjoyed in your company. Uh, so it's just kind of an interesting uh, aspect of he, he is reflecting back not all the momentous points in his life. He still remembers that first sort of romantic flush and so forth. But I think the thing to take away from uh, Washington is his upbringing and his early life uh, into the point of marrying Martha. You can see that it's very, very different uh, than what we typically uh, encounter uh, in today's world. He dies in December of 99 and Martha dies three years later. Let's talk about Alexander Hamilton. What was his early life like? Um, his mother, Rachel, uh, marries a gentleman at the age of 16. Um, and uh, he, the, her husband, uh, is 28. And it's a very unhappy marriage. Uh, Rachel's running around having affairs. She's been jailed. And eventually she uh, escapes and moves to St. Kitts down in the Virgin Islands. And there she meets a gentleman by the name of James Hamilton. And uh, with Hamilton, uh, they're not married because she is already married. Uh, she has uh, two boys, two sons uh, with James Hamilton, James Jr. and Alexander. Um, again, she has difficulty with relationships. And so uh, in 1765, she throws James Sr out and that leaves her alone with Alexander who at that point is eight years old. She dies three years later. Alexander uh, is um, 13 and he's basically with his brother alone. Um, Rachel's first husband reappears uh, down in the Virgin Island and takes over the little business that Rachel had developed. And that cuts Alexander off uh, from any type of support. And at the age of 13, he manages to get a clerk's job in an import-export business, uh, a counting house, if you will, in the Virgin Islands. And uh, he starts there as a clerk and begins to learn the business. And this is where Alexander Hamilton really begins to get sort of a, a sense of business and export import businesses and that type of thing. A um, couple years later, there's a hurricane that comes through uh, the Virgin Islands and uh, destroys a lot of business. And Alexander Hamilton, as well as having a, a, a gift for figures and business, also can write, as we well know later on. And he writes an article in the local newspaper about the devastation of this hurricane. And a minister reads this article, is impressed by this young man, and arranges for a scholarship to bring him to the United States, specifically a scholarship uh, to uh, the College of New Jersey. And so he, he comes up to New Jersey, as it turns out, uh, he is boarded in the governor's mansion, uh, who coincidentally has four daughters, one of whom, Kitty, uh, is 22. And this is Hamilton's introduction to girls, uh, working in an accounting house down in the Virgin Islands, works in a lot of social life, but he's now thrown into the high society social life uh, in the governor's circle of friends and so forth. 
And so he's quite bright. And uh, so he hears about a college uh, in New Jersey uh, that is very good. And so uh, back then there weren't any college boards. You had to be interviewed by the board of trustees of the institution. So Hamilton goes down for his interview with the board of trustees at Princeton. And during the course of the interview, he makes clear to them that he is so bright and so quick that he will be able to earn his Princeton diploma in three years and get out. Well, the board of trustees were somewhat insulted by the fact that this young whippersnapper is telling them that he was so bright that he could get a Princeton diploma in three years. They told him in very frank terms that a Princeton diploma required four years of intense study, at which point Hamilton says, forget it. He leaves, he goes back and enrolls in Columbia. Um, while he becomes uh, uh, enrolled in Columbia, he becomes fast friends with uh, the president of Columbia and so forth. Um, and at that point, while he was at Columbia, the war breaks out in 1776. And there was a student militia, which he had joined. And the st student militia forms up and marches to Massachusetts. And so he's now in the army. Uh, and uh, he uh, was made a, a captain in the artillery. And we fast forward to a point in the war where uh, Washington is being pushed out of New York and he is fleeing across New Jersey to eventually get to the Delaware, crossing the Delaware. While he was fleeing across New Jersey, um, the uh, English were trailing him and as sort of a, a backstop, uh, Washington had a number of his uh, troops pushed back so the rest of the troops could escape uh, across uh, and across the Delaware. In amongst those troops uh, were the artillery um, unit headed by Hamilton. And he did such a great job uh, that he frankly enabled Washington and the rest of the troops to escape. And he comes to the attention of Washington once everyone's across the Delaware, and he uh, becomes a fast friends with Washington and eventually becomes Washington's aide de camp. And Washington entrusted him so much that he and Washington would have discussions in the evening at dinner in terms of what Washington wanted done the next day. And then he would leave it to Hamilton after dinner to go back and write up the orders, would quickly read them to assure himself that the Hamilton had carried out his instructions accurately. And then the next morning, Hamilton, at the ripe old age of 20 or 21, is riding around to the senior generals and the rest of the army handing out uh, orders to them. And so uh, this was quite extraordinary. As a result of his uh, being Washington's aide de camp, um, when the army went into winter quarters, uh, they did, the first uh, year they went into Morristown. And this really became winter quarters uh, were like a social season for the senior officers. And the senior officers would bring their wives to winter quarters because there were plays and balls and dinners and so forth and so on. And of course, the senior officers would bring their wives and their daughters. And it was at this point where uh, Hamilton encounters uh, Philip Schuyler's uh, daughter, uh, one of his daughters, uh, Elizabeth, known as Betsy. And Alexander falls in love with her. Uh, the Schuyler family, very, very powerful and influential uh, in New York. And um, during the course of the war, he maintains a sort of a distant relationship corresponding back and forth uh, with uh, her. And toward the end of the war, he actually leaves the army uh, and begins to study the law 
uh, in New York City because he's beginning to think about what's going to happen after the war and he wants to marry Elizabeth. Uh, and so uh, toward the end of the war, when things are sort of uh, dying down, um, he marries her, her in, in Albany. They moved to New York City where he had begun to study the law. He became a lawyer and, as we all know, became very, very well-connected, very powerful. Uh, but again, think about what his upbringing was in terms of the experience in the Virgin Islands and then uh, being an orphan and then uh, coming to New York and eventually uh, ending up being Washington's aide-de-camp. A little bit different experience than what maybe you and I have had. Thomas Jefferson, uh, down in Virginia, uh, as an early uh, boy, uh, he with, was very much involved with uh, music and um, he read a great deal. Uh, he was not the typical boy uh, back then. Uh, he was interested in the arts and reading and music and so forth and so on. His father, Peter, uh, wanted to toughen uh, Jefferson up. Uh, he was unable to do that. Uh, and Jefferson's father dies when he's 14. We see a pattern here uh, in terms of childhood and, and into adolescence and so forth. And um, he's very bright. He was tutored uh, privately and eventually was uh, admitted to uh, Williamsburg at the age of 16. Um, and he's somewhat uh, coming in off of the farm, if you will, again, into Williamsburg, which is the Virginia capital, uh, again, exposed to high society. And this is completely different than what he was used to uh, growing up uh, earlier. And uh, he first touch with romance was with a young lady by the name of Bre uh, Rebecca Burwell. And she just was not very interested in him, perhaps uh, because of his humble background. And anyway, uh, she rejects him. And after that rejection, he decides that he's going to uh, concentrate, become a lawyer, read for the bar, uh, and eventually become, becomes a lawyer and so forth. Um, he also uh, has uh, romantic feelings towards one of his best friend's uh, wife. Uh, that uh, may sound familiar uh, from our experience. And um, she rejects him uh, and, and he moves on. He encounters uh, Martha Willis. Uh, she is married, uh, has a couple of children, and at the age of 22, she is a widow. Again, a familiar ring to the earlier people that we talked about. Uh, she is uh, very wealthy, and uh, her, her family is very wealthy, and um, she is apparently uh, very social, uh, sprightly, uh, that type of thing. And um, he has romantic feelings towards her, but her father steps in, uh, who her father is a trade uh, slave trader, uh, and steps in on the basis that uh, Jefferson's just not good enough for his daughter. Uh, he decides to build a cabin, uh, which he does, 1771, uh, and it's up on a mountain, and uh, you know eventually what that, quote, cabin uh, becomes. He continues to sort of romance uh, Mar uh, Martha, and eventually father gives in, and Jefferson marries Martha at the beginning of 72. Excuse me. There we go. Um, the family life for Martha and uh, Jefferson, uh, you can see outlined here, uh, they get married. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, John 
uh, Wallace dies, and uh, he names Jefferson as the executor. And um, they go along, and uh, he and Martha begin to have children, and actually the quite a few children, as you can see. Um, Jefferson begins to get involved in politics uh, through Williamsburg, the capital, and, and so forth, and so on. And as you can see, uh, he and Martha have a number of children. And with each succeeding child, uh, Martha had uh, difficulty in uh, bearing children and so forth. And um, eventually, uh, in 1782, uh, at the age of 33, uh, she dies. However, before she dies, and she's very sick, it's pretty clear that she is dying, she gets Jefferson to pledge that after she dies, he pledges to her never to remarry, and he does make that pledge. Okay. So, uh, Martha bore seven children, five of them died, and uh, only two survived, Martha and Mary, um, and they survived to uh, adulthood. And you can see the, the Martha's pregnancies. So, many, many children, uh, a lot of child uh, deaths. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jefferson uh, becomes quite well known. And um, he goes, he uh, is asked by the Continental Congress uh, to go to uh, France. And um, he decides that he wants to take his older daughter uh, and he uh, takes her, Mary. And he decides that he uh, wants to take one of his slave boys and have him study to be a French cook. And so uh, he takes the boy whose last name happens to be Hemings. And uh, he, the boy, and his oldest daughter uh, move to Paris. Uh, where he uh, is involved in uh, negotiations uh, uh, to end the war and so forth and so on. And um, so uh, he is sent to Paris, as I said, and he's appointed to there and he is in Paris and he frankly has sort of a fling uh, with uh, a woman by the name of Causeway uh, she is married, uh, and uh, he writes actually a, a very well-known uh, piece by him uh, called "His Heart, uh, His Head Versus His Heart," and um, so eventually that romance sort of peters out, and he decides to send for his second daughter, uh, Mary, uh, so she could come over and join him and Martha. Uh, and James, who is now studying to be French cook. Well, Mary's nine years old. It's typically a three month voyage uh, from America over to Europe. And so he decides that understandably, uh, Mary should have a, uh, a companion to go with her. And he asks or directs that Sally Hemings, age 14, who is James's sister, will accompany Mary to come over and so forth. And actually Mary and Sally land in London and they are met uh, by uh, Abigail Adams, who then escorts 
them over uh, to Paris. And so that's how Sally Hemings uh, gets to Paris. Let's talk about Sally a little bit. Um, she uh, was a, had been uh, a, a slave in the uh, Wales estate that now has descended to uh, Jefferson. And uh, Wales uh, had an affair with a slave woman by the, uh, who was known as Elizabeth. Elizabeth was half white. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, she was half white. She has this affair with Wales. Um, and as a result of that, uh, Sally uh, is born. And so uh, what we now know is, is that Sally is actually 75% uh, white. Uh, only 25% black. Um, and uh, we also know uh, that as it turns out that Wallace was Sally's father, but he was also Martha's father. So Martha and Sally are half sisters. Um, and while there are no uh, portraits or anything of either woman, uh, it is believed that there's a high likelihood uh, that Sally Hemings and Martha uh, probably were uh, fairly similar facially in terms of build and so forth and so on. Uh, so in any event, Sally comes uh, is, comes over uh, with the daughter and they spend a couple of years in Paris. The war ends uh, and they come back. They return uh, back uh, in 1789 and Sally is now uh, 16. Jefferson becomes Secretary of State uh, in 1790. And there has been tons of speculation as to whether there was a relationship between Sally and Jefferson while in Paris or when they came back. Um, and uh, that's something that's just unknown. However, uh, Sally eventually gave birth to uh, six children, the earliest of which was born in 1795. Uh, so there was a five year lapse uh, between the time that she and Jefferson returned back uh, from Paris in 1790, I'm sorry, in 1789, a six year lapse before she had her first child. So uh, it's left a speculation as to whether there was any intimate relationship between Jefferson and uh, Sally Hemings while they were in Paris or shortly after they return uh, back to uh, the US. Interestingly enough, one of the things that Jefferson did on his plantation is he kept a farm book uh, where he kept uh, records in terms of his holdings, which included say, slaves. Um, and he would, would record uh, the birth of um, children born to slaves and so forth and record the mother and the father you know, and the name of the newly born uh, slave child, and so forth, with one exception. And those were, he did not record the name of the father of the children born to Sally Hemings. Let's talk about Ben Franklin, our last uh, founding father for this morning. Uh, he was born in Boston and uh, there, he was uh, one of, I believe it was 10 children, and his father was a candle maker. So I think we should pause just for a second and think about uh, a family of 12, and uh, how that was supported by someone who made candles, notwithstanding the fact that candles, there were a lot of candles burned back then, but it would have to take a lot of candles to support a family of 12 uh, and so forth. Uh, he apprenticed as a printer, and uh, he had problems with a brother, and so he flees uh, from Boston, makes his way down to New York, and then uh, arrives in Philadelphia And at the age of 17, and he's broke, not surprisingly, uh, given his family background and so forth. The picture that you're seeing on the left uh, 
he is walk. It's a, he has arrived in Philadelphia. This is the day he arrives in Philadelphia, and behind him is the wharves and so forth, and he's walking west up Market Street, and as he's walking past. Uh, there is a boarding house there and a young lady and their eyes sort of meet and uh, they smile a little bit and he keeps walking past and that young lady was Deborah Reed and we'll uh, we'll get back to her in a few minutes uh, but he goes on he gets a job as an apprentice a printer and eventually gets his own print business uh, he um, begins to develop that business. He uh, starts a reading group, a guild, and also starts what we now know as the Philadelphia Library. And um, he, uh, in his diaries, he refers to, quote, low women, close quote, uh, that uh, he has relationships with. He eventually fathers an illegitimate child in 1730. Uh, and it's problematic because he now has a responsibility to uh, his son, William, uh, and uh, uh, he's looking around to try and figure out how he's going to continue his lifestyle with now a child. Obviously, the lifestyle changes. Um, getting back to Deborah, the young lady that he walked past on his first day in Philadelphia, uh, time goes by. She marries a gentleman by the name of John Roberts, who disappears, and therefore he's not around, and it's impossible for her to divorce him because she can't serve divorce papers on him. Uh, she is uh, poorly educated, and eventually she and uh, Franklin enter into sort of a relationship, not a marriage, but a relationship, and apparently the agreement between the two of them is that she would take responsibility for raising uh, Franklin's son, William, and Franklin would provide for her. Um, she apparently was, had a difficult uh, personality and um, was difficult with the children. She eventually has a, a daughter uh, by Franklin who's uh, named Sarah or known as Sally. Uh, as I said, she is a different person, a difficult person, and William attempts to leave and go to sea at the age of 15 simply to get away from her. While she may have had a different personality, she apparently had quite a, a, a mind for business and became very successful in terms of a bookshop uh, where uh, many of the books were printed by Franklin, and uh, she, there was stationery and paper and so forth and so on. And she becomes uh, rather successful and enables Ben to retire at the right old age of 42. And that's when he gets involved in politics and science. Um, he is sent in 1754. Uh, Congress, uh, actually he, Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, the colony of Pennsylvania, uh, sends him uh, to London and uh, to develop business relationships that would benefit uh, the colony of Pennsylvania. He expects Deborah to go uh, with her. She refuses because she's afraid of the journey, the sail uh, to England. And she continues to refuse. And eventually he leaves her and sails to England. And uh, he eventually enters into a relationship uh, in London uh, with a woman by the name of Margaret Stevenson. Uh, she uh, Initially, she was his landlady, and they were together for 20 years. We're going to fast forward, 1774, Deborah, back here in Pennsylvania, uh, dies while Ben is still in England. A year later, he decides that he's going to return to uh, America, and he quite literally leaves Margaret Stevenson standing on the wharf in London uh, and sails uh, back uh, to Pennsylvania and um, uh, so forth. Um, he, a couple of years later, is sent now back to Paris uh, to negotiate uh, the loans and also the peace accord uh, with England. And uh, 
he apparently uh, was a very, very socially active gentleman and so forth, and returns back to America in 1785. Very quickly, the, uh, these are four uh, founding fathers. Hopefully we've taken a look at uh, their early lives that uh, uh, maybe you weren't fully aware of and uh, sort of reflections in terms of what do we see in terms of family life and uh, marriages and remarriages and so forth and so on. And we take a look at the four gentlemen in terms of uh, early death uh, and absence of father uh, all four of them uh, had that experience. Higher education, Washington and Franklin had none. Uh, they were ba basically self-educated. Uh, Jefferson and Hamilton uh, you know, did uh, go to college. Um, married and ambitions. Uh, Washington uh, was a widow. Uh, Jefferson was a widower. Um, or, I'm sorry. Uh, Washington and Jefferson both married widows, and uh, Franklin was sort of a widower uh, by his own volition. Romantic relationships, all four of them had sort of early romantic experiences and so forth, uh, and uh, eventually those didn't pan out, and they eventually married. So um, I hope we perhaps uh, provided some new information to you folks in terms of some of the founding fathers and maybe have a fuller appreciation of what family life was like uh, back in the mid and late uh, 18th century. So again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present this information and I hope you found it uh, enjoyable and enlightening. I, I wanna jump in here, uh, Don, thank you so much for that talk that was extremely interesting and enlightening. Um, I do want to remind folks that if you scroll to the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll see a box that says Q&A. Um, you're able to type in some questions for Don if you, if you have any, and uh, he can review them and answer them. Uh, we have a, a few minutes here for this uh, period. So Don, again, thanks so much. Um, if you don't mind, I, I can toss out a question maybe to get things started. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, there's really no way you could answer this um, specifically, but just kind of looking for your thoughts or speculation. Um, ben Franklin, obviously um, the timeline didn't really um, enable him to do this, but I'm, I'm curious if he was a bit younger, do you think he would have had interest in pursuing the presidency? Um, and, and if he would have interest in that, do you think he had um, kind of the nationwide um, appeal to to win that office. Um, you know, I, he was obviously a unique character, so I'm not sure if his kind of um, personality would translate to that office. But I, I am just kind of curious if if you ever considered that, or if he um, if you th if there was any documentation that he may have had interest in that if he was a bit younger. Well, just just speaking for myself, you know, mm -hmm. I was just thinking um, he was not interested or certainly not involved in politics uh, as Jefferson was, for example, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Washington uh, in terms of being a presidency. I always think of, of Franklin as being more intellectual, professorial, if you will. Uh, he, he just was interested in a variety, a wide uh, range of subjects and sort of intellectual pursuits. Um, he, while he was in Philadelphia uh, before retiring, and uh, he, he got a group together, and I'm struggling to come up with the name of the group, but it was sort of like, almost like a book club. Mm -hmm. And so I think if, by personality, if you would compare, say, Washington uh, and Franklin, Washington is the soldier, politician, uh, governor type person, Whereas uh, Franklin is more the intellectual. Uh, he founded the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, there was a Pennsylvania hospital was founded by him. The Pennsylvania or the Philadelphia Library uh, was founded by him. So I, I think the, the Franklin, I think personality was more intellectual rather than just pure political. 
Thank you, thank you. Don, if you notice, uh, uh, Marie Stevens has um, submitted a question in the Q&A portion. So if you um, can click on that box, you can read her question. And if it's something you think you can answer, feel free. Um, okay, is that the box can... with the question mark? Uh, it should say Q&A at the bottom. Okay. Do you see that if you mouse over the screen? No, I... If you're not seeing it, I can just read it out loud. Yeah, if you would, please, because I... Okay, Marie says, thank you for the fascinating facts about these founding fathers. I wonder how these facts were passed on so that we know them today. You cited the picture of Franklin and Red, for example. How was something like that preserved? How would anyone have thought that was significant? I, I'm sorry. I'm, um, I guess she's asking about how that picture of Franklin was, um, you know, became a significant part of history and how something like that was passed along. Okay. I, I've, while you were reading it, I, I've been able to find the uh, question okay. and answer Great. screen. Um, well, uh, you know, particularly Franklin um, was well known in Philadelphia. Um, he, he was a printer. Uh, he, he was very involved in the society of Philadelphia because he, he, he printed newspapers uh, and, and so forth and so on. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's not, I mean, you, there are numerous books about Franklin uh, in, in terms of, you know, reading up on that. Um, I don't know that there's one particular biography of Franklin that, you know, would sort of be the best of all. Um, he, he's, he uh, led a very open life. Uh, and so it's, it's just very, very well known. Um, I'm going down. Dave apparently has a question. Uh, didn't Franklin have much to do with working with the French uh, during the war and thereafter involved uh, with politics? Well, um, yes, uh, but involved in the politics, uh, he was... In, his involvement with politics, I would say, would be more sort of, for example, being an ambassador as opposed to being, you know, elected office uh, and so forth. And again, uh, Franklin, you know, really was an intellectual uh, and so forth. And, and so I think that um, um, maybe I could, if I could, make the distinction between being an involved in politics and being a politician. Um, he, he was the former, he was not the latter. Uh, uh, I, I hope that's responsive to the, the gentleman's question. Um, Dorothy asked, uh, what was Franklin's relationship with his son, William? Not very good. Um, and I think the, the best illustration of that uh, is that uh, William eventually became uh, the governor of New Jersey and uh, was on the British side of the war. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, you have father and son on two different sides uh, of hostilities. Uh, that pretty much uh, sums that up, I think. Uh, so. Um, now, I believe, I believe very late in life, they may have reconciled. Um, but uh, I think just the fact that uh, he was colonial governor of New Jersey uh, probably gives us uh, insight in terms of, uh, for the majority of their lives, the relationship was not very close. Uh, next question by Sandy is, did Franklin marry Deborah? No, uh, that was impossible because Deborah had married and her husband disappeared. 
uh, was purportedly uh, down somewhere in the Caribbean, but I don't hold me to that. But because uh, she was married, she couldn't divorce him because she couldn't find him. Um, and so uh, as a result, uh, she was not uh, eligible to marry Franklin. And um, I think, you know, that there, there was some feelings there in the relationship, uh, but I think it was more uh, an arrangement of convenience uh, than sort of a, a classic uh, romantic relationship culminating uh, in marriage. Um, no, uh, she did not become his wife because she was unable to. John, uh, I'd like to uh, ask a, ver a verbal question. Uh, can you characterize the relationship between Jefferson and Washington? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know that I really consider it. Um, I think that uh, Washington, I would say, um, if I can sort of use an analogy, Washington was more of a physical guy. Um, and, and Jefferson was more of a bookworm. Um, that, that may be, and it probably is an overgeneralization. But again, if we, we take a look at the, the personalities of the two gentlemen, uh, Washington was uh, out there serving out in the woods. Uh, he got involved in military activity uh, by the age of 20 uh, and uh, was involved in uh, all that. When he did get involved, uh, when Washington did get involved in politics in the Continental Congress and the war breaks out, um, keep in mind uh, that, that uh, he came to sessions of the Continental Congress in uniform. And uh, so, I mean, he was very soldier-like where uh, Jefferson, uh, by personality, uh, was more of an intellectual bookworm. Uh, was, he, he, he was the ambassador. Washington was the soldier. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think we're uh, just about to wrap up. Uh, it's been a little bit over an hour. We've had as many as 44 participants, which is really outstanding. Uh, I, I, must, I must add a comment about the other voice that you have heard. That was the voice of Christian Menno, the uh, Director of Communications for Doylestown Presbyterian Church, and the orchestra, I should say, the uh, director, producer of the technical aspects of this presentation today. So thank you, Christian. Um, Don, uh, I wanna, wanna thank you for um, this wonderful presentation today. And well, thank you for uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this is really what I enjoy is talking history. Yeah, and, and you do it well. And you make me. I, I only live an hour from Philadelphia. You make me want to get on the train, COVID allowing, and go see the the uh, Museum of the Revolution. I have not seen it yet, and and um, I hear great things about it. Yes, that, that's a, it's a great uh, museum. Um, Actually, I, I uh, worked there for a little bit over a year. Unfortunately, uh, as of this Friday, all the museums in Philadelphia and perhaps the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania are going to be closed because of uh, COVID. So uh, put that on your list for the new year. Tragic. Uh, and we certainly uh, thank the participants today. As I said, there were um, as many as 44, wonderful turnout. Uh, and uh, it occurs to me that you may, in addition to the questions we've heard, there may be others out there. So let me give you an email address where you could uh, pose questions to Don. Um, so if you have a paper and pencil handy, that email address is D, as in Doylestown, D-P-C, Doylestown Presbyterian Church, D-P-C, at D, as, as in Doylestown, dtownpc.org. Let me repeat the whole thing. DPC at dtownpc.org. Uh, they'll come to the church, Don, but we'll, of course, forward them to you and find a way to get uh, back to our participants.
That would be great. Don, Chris, Chris, Christian, Don, anything you'd like to add? I just want to thank Don again for um, uh, his patience through the technical difficulties. Um, his speech was great. His talk was, was informative. And I also want to thank everybody for, um, for tuning in and for asking some questions on their own. Um, Alan, thanks to you as well for, for putting this all together. Thanks to all. Well, I guess we'll wrap up and say goodbye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Stay well. <laughs>